It's an area where we have long wanted to be able to get into. It's a, a legendary area that has been visited, but only uh, a few times. Um, there are local indigenous communities that live there, um, but it's really been an area that's cut off to outside influences for a long while. So uh, we've really been taking an opportunity to get in there, um, although it's been a number of years in, in the planning. And I mentioned a few of the things that you've found, but tell us more about them. Well, we always knew it was going to be a, a special area. We've flown over it. We've, we've looked at it. We've had some advanced um, parties going in to, uh, to plan the surveys. We always knew it should be biologically quite special. It's um, almost entirely untouched by industrial development or um, uh, logging and other areas that have impacted the rest of the island. Uh, but we didn't quite realize how diverse and unique this, um, this area is actually turning out to be. We, to date, we think we've discovered over 80 new species of, of plants and animals, and that's really on a cursory, really four-week survey. Mm -hmm. So um, we need to get back in there. We need to uh, document more, but already what we're, we're finding puts the site as, uh, as high up on the list of, of global importance. We'll stay with this live from New York, because we have Stanley Johnson here, who has been involved in conservation for many years and has worked with the UN on, on that issue as well. I just wonder whether these kind of discoveries, exciting though they are, make the life of a conservation is harder? Does it make it harder to persuade people that matters are serious, that, that there are less species rather than more at the moment? No, I think it's tremendously exciting. And um, what is perfectly obvious is this sort of area in Papua New Guinea, which I haven't been to, which I'm mm. going to this summer, is you know, vitally important, not just for the new species um, you know, which are being discovered, but for the fact that it is also biologically unbelievably rich. I've actually just come back from another, another one of these places. This is the Yasuni National Park in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. And this is actually almost um, as remarkable, I'd say probably even more remarkable. It, just extraordinary. An area half the size, half the size of Wales, 100,000 in species of insects in, in one hectare, would you believe it? And then and more, more mammals, more amphibians, in, just in that small space than the whole of Canada. But and, you would tell our viewers, I'm guessing, that we need to take care of this, that these animals, these species are under threat. Uh, is not just the animals and the species. Basically, it's the habitats, and that's, that's the answer to in, in Papua New Guinea. If you take these three great areas of the world, you know, the Amazon rainforest, the Congo rainforest, and the rainforests of Southeast Asia, if the world managed to save those three areas, well, basically, you would be solving so many of the world's problems, climate change and biodiversity. And that's why, for me, uh, for example, this Yasuni rainforest has been a most remarkable experience. And if we could go back to New York, I wonder if... Uh, your organization would want to, to work with others. Does there need to be a coordinated effort to understand these three rainforests and document what's within them? Yes, that's absolutely right. I mean, I think the, the only way we're going to be successful is we work at, at all levels, from the community level, from those people who are living on the ground at these sites, in and around these sites, all the way up to the global level on agreeing accords and, and uh, getting commitments from governments mm -hmm. Um, about their actions. So it's, it's only possible if we work um, across those levels. And for a group like the Wildlife Conservation Society working at in Latin America as, uh, um, in, in the Neotropics, mm -hmm. in the Congo Basin and, and the tropics of Southeast Asia, uh, these collaborations are going to be the only possible way of, of, of having true conservation. And I think the point is also well made that, um, that these areas are not just for the species or, again, these, these incredible giant rats. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the area in, the, in Papua New Guinea provides a, a key watershed for, um, for thousands of people um, who depend on its fisheries and natural resources and, of course, most basically water. Well, and as you're talking, we can see this giant rat, which I have to say is rather stealing the show from the other 79 species and uh, plants that you've discovered. Tell us more about it. Well, it's, um, we've, we've been using camera traps, so um, automatic cameras set in the forest that uh, trigger when there is uh, heat and movement in front of them. Uh, and uh, we're getting some sort of scale by the vegetation and, and other animals around it. Uh, and they are just enormous. And they, um, they are enormous because also... Uh, in areas where there are no naturally large predators, mammals and ground-based mammals and birds tend to grow at an enormous rate. Where actually predators have been brought in from outside, 
um, and invasive species have come in, they've often disappeared. And that's been true of many of the uh, islands of the Pacific, uh, New Zealand as, as well. And this is just an indication of just how intact this site is and just how important it is to get in preventative measures rather than re reactive ones. Well, we certainly appreciate you joining us from New York. Thank you very much for your time. And Stanley, just before I let you go, this is interesting, is it? Not, so it's not just about keeping humans out, it's also about keeping animals that don't belong there out. The invasive species is, is, is tremendously important in Galapagos, for example, which is another one of Ecuador's, you know, mm -hmm. crown jewels. The invasive species problem is absolutely acute. Just one point. Sometimes it's a question... Take one if you would. Very good you've got some uncontacted tribes in, in the Yasun. And one of the things you may need to do is actually not you know, work with local people, except indirectly.